Hi, welcome back. One of the basic questions you face when you look at a company, any business, is what's the right mix of debt and equity for this business? Notice how I did not phrase that question. I didn't ask what's the right mix of debt, debt and equity for all businesses because no one mix works for every business. And one of the tools available to optimize that mix, find the right mix for you, is to look at the cost of capital. Remember I called it the Swiss army knife of all finance tools? Well, that's because it can be used as a hurdle rate, it can be used as an optimizing tool. And here's how it gets used as an optimizing tool. As a business, you'd like a lower cost of capital rather than a higher one, right? At first sight, the answer, the reason is simple. A lower cost of capital means you can take more projects and your existing project will be worth more. From a valuation perspective, a lower cost of capital also gives you a higher value as a company. So one way to think about the right mix of debt and equity for your company is what is that mix of debt and equity at which your cost to capital is minimized? I've built a spreadsheet that I've used over time to do this. It's not rocket science. I won't claim it's perfect, but it tries to come up with the cost to capital at different debt ratios. Because the reason it's not that simple is as your debt ratio changes, both your cost of equity and your cost of debt could change, and even the tax rate you apply to your cost of debt could change. So I'm going to use Disney as an example, and this is with a new version of my spreadsheet that I created in early 2018 to accommodate some of the changes created by the 2017 tax reform. So let me go item by item through, and the best way for you to learn how to use a spreadsheet is pick a company and do what I did for Disney for your company. So at the top, you have the name of your company, pretty straightforward. Right below, I put the date so that I know when I did this, because obviously when I look at Disney in 2019, I might get a very different optimal debt ratio. The first number I need to get started is your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, your EBITDA for your most recent 12 months. It could be your last fiscal year, the last 12 months of data. So this is the EBITDA for Disney in the trailing 12 months at the start of, so basically this was through from the last quarter of 2016 through the, the, through the third quarter of 2017, most recent 12 months, there's my EBITDA. Right below that, as for the depreciation amortization, the best way to usually find this, the EBITDA, of course, you should be able to find your income statement, but the best place to find your depreciation amortization is in your statement of cash flows because that's the depreciation amortization claim for taxes. So that's my depreciation amortization. Stay in the statement of cash flows because somewhere in that statement of cash flows, you should see capital expenditures. So it'll be a negative cash flow, but just enter it as an absolute number. So there's my capital expenditure for Disney. Then I ask you for interest expense in your debt. Go back to your income statement. Tell me what the interest expense was in the most recent 12 months, that same period from which you got the EBITDA. Then I ask you for the marginal tax rate to use. Not the effective tax rate, but the tax rate that I should be applying to get your tax benefit from them. For Disney, I'm going to use the marginal tax rate for the US. For most companies, I use the marginal tax rate, the statutory tax rate of the country in which that company is incorporated. And if you're interested in finding out what the marginal tax rate is for different countries, that's available on my website. You can look it up. It's not a, it's not a big deal. Now, for the U.S., this number has changed very dramatically in 2018 relative to what it was in 2017. In 2017, that would have been 40%. Now it's about 24, reflecting the drop in the federal corporate tax rate from 35 to 21% with state and local taxes added on. Then I ask you whether you have a rating for a company. Now, if you do have a rating, enter the rating. And if you don't, I actually ask you to enter not rated. So in the case of Disney, there was a single A rating. I used the rating. Then I ask you for the cost of debt that goes with that rating. Built into the spreadsheet is a worksheet called default spreads. If you go in there, you'll actually see what the default spreads are for different ratings classes. And in this case, I use the default spread for a single A rated company. And that default spread added on to my risk-free rate gives me a cost of debt of 3.49%. If you don't have a rating, that default spread, the, the worksheet that I was in, actually allows you to compute a synthetic rating for the company. A rating based on the interest coverage ratio and use the interest rate based on that. And I ask you for some pretty basic market stuff. Number of shares outstanding. If you have two classes of shares and three classes, make sure you include all the classes of shares and the stock price as of the most recent day. Then I ask you for an unlevered beta. Now, this might be a little messy if you don't even know what it is, but it's actually the beta of your business. I computed by looking at the business of businesses you're in. For Disney, I broke them down into the, into the four businesses they were in, which range from entertainment, move, uh, so basically it's movies, broadcasting, theme parks, and consumer products. That weighted average is 0.92. That becomes my unlevered beta. 
My level beta gets computed. That's why it's shaded green. I, I level your beta based on your existing debt ratio and tax rate. Reflect what the beta will be at your existing debt ratio. Disney's existing debt ratio is about 13.2% debt, about 86.79% equity. Then I ask you for cash and marketable securities. Go to the balance sheet, look up that number. That should be the cash and marketable securities, short-term investments. Don't get carried away and start piling things in which don't belong in there. Then I ask you for your book value debt. Stay on the balance sheet. This is just the interest-bearing debt. Short-term debt, short-term portion of long-term debt, capital leases, include long-term borrowings, all in there. Corporate bonds as well as traditional bank loans. And that's my bank debt. Then I ask you whether you know the market value. If you have no idea what I'm asking for, the safest answer here is no. If you have an estimate of the market value, some companies actually report the fair value of their debt in the footnotes and you trust the accountant say yes. I would actually suggest you say no to that and yes to the next one and enter the maturity of the debt, which should be somewhere in the footnotes if you can find it. If you cannot find it, just say no to both and I'll just use the book value of debt as the market value of debt. Not a big deal for most, com most companies. Then to complete the process, I ask you whether you have any operating leases. If you say yes, then make sure you go into the lease worksheet and enter the lease commitments for the next five years and beyond. For Disney, you see those numbers entered in there. That should be in the most recent fiscal financials and enter the lease expense from the most recent year. I will convert the leases into debt. So don't double count by counting the leases as debt and entering it as your book value of debt and then asking me to do it again because I plan to help you by computing the present value of your debt. We're almost there. Then I put in one of the things that the 2017 code brought in, which is a restriction on interest expenses. If you're outside the U.S., you don't have the restriction just to enter no, you're all safe. If you're in the U.S. and you enter yes, then I ask you, what is the, what is the metric or the measure on which the, the, the restriction is going to be based on? In the U.S., from now through 2021, the measure is going to be EBITDA and the restriction is going to be that interest expenses cannot exceed 30% of EBITDA. Starting in 2021, that number is going to become EBIT. It's a tighter constraint. Let's still say 30% of EBIT then. For the moment, it's 30% of EBITDA. Then I introduce a tweak in the model. One of the limitations of the cost of capital approach is I keep the operating income and cash flows fixed. As your rating goes from triple A to double A to single A to triple B to double B to single B, and that might be a trifle unrealistic, especially if you worry about the fact that as your rating drops, people will start want, stop, stop wanting to do business with you. Customers might stop it. It depends on the firm, but this can be, so if you want to incorporate that expected problem from, this is called indirect bankruptcy costs. Just enter yes to this question. And I give you a choice of three different choices, a high, medium, or low, depending on how big indirect. See, why would it be different for different companies? Some companies are hurt more by the perception that they're, they're in trouble than others. And companies with long-term projects, physical assets. So basically, I give you that choice. And I ask you what the risk-free rate is now. In the case of Disney, I use the US T-bond rate because I'm doing everything in US dollars. We have different currency under the risk-free rate in that currency. And I ask for an equity risk premium. Go back and take a look at my sessions on equity risk premiums. I've entered the mature market premium here, though you could argue that maybe for Disney, I should be using a weighted average. I was a little lazy here. I entered the mature market premium. I should be really using a weighted average of the different parts of the world they operate. Incidentally, if you're a company in a country with default risk, a country like Nigeria or Brazil or India, you might want to enter the country default spread here. Because here's what I will do. As I estimate your cost to debt every debt ratio, I will assume you carry two burdens on your shoulder. One is your own burden as a company in terms of default risk, and the other is the country default spread. Then to estimate your rate, your ratings at different debt ratios, I use a lookup table. And the lookup table, I give you two sets of numbers. One if you're a large market cap company, and one if you're a small market cap company. If you're a large market cap company, enter one. If you're a small market cap company, enter two. If you're an emerging market company, always enter two. You'll use that lookup table. Then the last two options, just leave it yes for the moment. Basically, I ask you whether you want to assume the existing debt is refinanced with the new rates. The safest assumption to make. If you enter no here, I will let you rip off your existing bond orders because you will keep the rates for those bond orders at low rates while you keep going to a higher rate. Unrealistic in the long term. That's why I prefer to leave it at yes. And then 
I ask you whether you want to bring your current rating up because remember, I estimate ratings at every other debt ratio with synthetic ratings. Your current rating might be very different. So if you want to bring it all to the same same scale, you can you can say you know yes to this. So um, if you if you don't like this option, just turn it to no. Again, I think it's safer to leave it at yes. That's pretty much it. If you look at the very top, I tell you what the existing debt ratio is, what the optimal is, and for Disney with their with the new tax code, it's about with it's about a forty percent optimal. Just as a word of, let's see what would have happened if we went to the old tax code. Let me change that to forty, and let me take away the restriction debt. I did take it away actually. So basically, let's see what happens. Often jumps to sixty. Are you surprised? Shouldn't be. The higher tax rate, I get a greater tax benefit. You see, what will happen if I end up making the tax benefit go away? No tax benefit at all. Let's see. Optimal goes to zero. Magic, right? Just play with it. That's the best way to get a sense of how debt affects value. Now you might be wondering how all of this happens. So do you want to see the sausage being made? It's actually not rocket science. Here's what I do. I take the numbers you give me in the on the input sheet and I try to compute what the cost of equity and the cost of debt and cost of capital with every debt ratio. Since I don't want this spreadsheet to become a black box, let me take you through the process of what's happening. So let's say you want to see what your cost of equity and cost of capital will be at a 10% debt ratio. I start with a 10% debt ratio. I convert the 10% debt ratio into debt to equity, 10 over 90. I look at how much dollar debt you will have at that debt ratio. And then comes the mechanics of working through my cost of equity and cost of debt at that debt ratio. I take your unlevered beta and I come up with a levered beta at the debt ratio. It's much higher, cost of equity goes up. That's the easy part. If you, then I work with your numbers, your EBITDA, your EBIT. I check to see whether you've turned on that distress option, because then I adjust your EBITDA, but if you don't, the EBITDA, depreciation, and EBIT stay the same at every debt ratio. Then I subtract out interest expenses. There's a bit of circularity here, but that's why you need the iteration box. I forgot to mention, that's critical. The iteration box in Excel has to be checked when you do this. I use the iterations to come up with the interest expense of the dollar debt. I use the interest expense to come up with an interest coverage ratio, the interest coverage ratio to come up with the rating and a cost of debt for your company. And then I do the check. Check for what? To make sure I haven't hit any of my constraints. The first check I run is whether your interest expense is more than 30% of EBITDA. If it is, then I cap your interest expense, which means your tax rate will not be the 24% or whatever you entered as your tax rate. In this case, since we're working with a 0% tax rate, let me go back and change that and make it a 40% tax rate so you can see this happening. If you see the 40% tax rate, it's 40% at 10% as well. Why? Because I don't hit the cap. The second check I run is to make sure your interest expense does not exceed your taxable income, your operating income. If you pass both tests, then I leave the tax rate at 40%. But as you go into higher debt ratios, for instance, as you go to, to a 70% debt ratio, notice that the constraints start to kick in. For Disney, at least, it looks like you never hit the 30% of EBITDA constraint. They have enough EBITDA, but they do run out of EBIT at some point in time. So basically, as you go down the spreadsheet, what I'm doing is using an interest coverage ratio to come up with the cost of debt, checking your tax rate, and coming up with the cost of capital at your new debt ratio. Now you're saying, how are you coming up with the firm value? Here's what I do. I start with the existing firm value. This is not a valuation spreadsheet. It's a capital structure spreadsheet. I take the existing value of the firm as a given. Then I take a change in cost of capital. So if your cost of capital decreases, I treat that as a savings that you get that year. And I take the present value of those savings. So as your cost of capital drops, your value as a firm goes up. As your cost of capital climbs, the value as a firm decreases. That is what I use to come up with the measure of what the optimal debt ratio is. So what you see me looking for here is where my cost of capital is minimized. Incidentally, if you pick the option of distress driving your EBITDA, then I can no longer focus on the lowest cost of capital. I have to look to see where your firm value is maximized. That then is the optimal debt ratio you saw on the front page. So I'm just repeating what this, this part of the worksheet allowed me to do. And that's the summary that you see. So my suggestion is, as I said, take a company, work through the numbers, go through the sausage factory, see how the numbers are computed. So you can, you can be comfortable with my computation. And if you don't like something, don't bitch and moan about it. Just fix it. It's an open spreadsheet. 
So if you'd prefer to use a different coverage ratio rather than interest coverage ratio, an EBITDA coverage ratio, be my guest. You'll have to create your own lookup table, but that's not that complicated. But essentially, your objective should be the same as mine. You want to maximize the value of the firm and find the mix that delivers it. Thank you very much for listening.